Um, so a, a lot of my, my work focuses on neural mechanisms, computational mechanisms of behavior, as Arvind mentioned, and also their implications for patient populations. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the early work in that respect. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about how we then sometimes want to use basic systems neuroscience to motivate our models of pathology, but then to go back to basic systems neuroscience to revise our models. So I want to tell you a little bit about some uh, an evolving story in the world of dopamine, and we can think about how that might relate to pathologies um, going forward. Okay, so uh, so many of you are probably familiar with uh, the story that's a couple decades old now about dopamine and reward prediction errors. Uh, and so just to, to remind you of this, Generally, when, if you record from dopamine neurons in the midbrain in an animal, and this, at this point it could be any species, but the original data came from monkeys, uh, what you see is that dopamine neurons kind of like it when, they, when the animal gets a reward that's better than expected. It's not just a reward per se, because if the reward is expected, so on the middle line here, this is when an animal was presented with some stimulus that predicted a reward, the animal knew that the reward was coming, and when the reward arrives, there's no increase in dopamine. But there is an increase in dopamine to the stimulus that predicted the reward. And so that's thought to be a reward prediction error because prior to the stimulus, the animal didn't know that they were getting a reward. And suddenly the value, the predicted reward value of the state is better than it was. But when the reward arrives, that was exactly predicted. If the reward doesn't arrive, then that's a negative prediction error. And that's when you see this sort of dip or drop in dopamine neurons. Uh, and so this was an observation that uh, Wolfram Schultz and others made in electrophysiology and computational neuroscientists like Peter Diane and Reed Montague, Andy Bartow and others noticed that uh, the patterns that you see in these dopamine neurons conformed to reward prediction errors as quantified in uh, computer science models of reinforcement learning. And that theory has been in incredibly useful and, and uh, predictive for me and many others in systems neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience and, and computational neuroscience. Um, and you can ask, you, you can look at, given that there are these reward prediction errors, how does it modify um, you know, activity and plasticity in the downstream areas? And so I focused a lot on the basal ganglia system uh, where dopamine is most prevalent. And uh, just to give a very high level gloss on this system, there are these different populations of neurons in the striatum that receive input from the cortex and that drive uh, action selection through a complex circuitry, the output of the basal ganglia and through the thalamus. And the two main populations of the striatum are sometimes referred to as go and no-go pathways because they're involved in sort of facilitating behavior and suppressing behavior or uh, what we think of rather as representing the benefits and the costs of alternative actions. And that's because uh, when dopamine neurons uh, go up with like a reward prediction error, for example, uh, they will potentiate neurons in the go pathway and suppress neurons in the no go pathway. And when the dopamine neurons go down, uh, there's this opposite pattern. And so more detailed computational modeling of the circuit led to this theory that uh, both activity and plasticity dynamics in these D1 and D2 pathways support reinforcement learning from positive and negative outcomes, but in an opponent manner, such that the brain is essentially storing two copies of value representations that specialize to represent positive and negative values. Uh, and so originally uh, building a neural network model of the system to account for a bunch of uh, sort of physiology and behavioral effects, we were then able to uh, make a prediction that's quite simple for behavior in human Parkinson's disease, which is that if Parkinson's patients who have a depleted dopamine levels, the dopamine neurons are, are dying in Parkinson's disease, when they're off medication, they have low levels of striatal dopamine. Uh, and according to the computational models of this circuit, that should lead to an impairment in learning from these positive reward prediction errors because there's not enough dopamine, but actually due to sparing of the, the uh, opponent pathway and, and its response to negative prediction errors, uh, you see that Parkinson's patients actually learn better in the reinforcement learning situation that requires avoiding negative outcomes and worse when they have to choose uh, decisions that led to positive reinforcement. Conversely, the same patients when they're on a dose of their medication that increases their dopamine levels, that improves their learning from positive prediction errors in accordance with what would be expected by these boosted reward prediction errors but it actually reduces learning from negative reward prediction errors. Uh, 
Uh, and that pattern was predicted by the model because when you give a patient a medication, it's like tonically stimulating uh, D2 receptors and preventing the endogenous effect of these dopamine dips from uh, inducing plasticity there. Uh, and we think that that's also relevant for their behaviors. We know that su a subset of Parkinson's patients when they're medicated become uh, pathological gamblers and compulsive shoppers and things that are consistent with uh, sort of insensitivity to negative prediction errors. Uh, and that basic pattern of results has been replicated in more than 15 different studies now. This is an example of one of them from another group who also showed that the effect of uh, asymmetry in these behavioral patterns is mediated by changes in the striatal response to negative prediction errors when given uh, medication in line with what I, I just told you. Um, uh, and finally, well, actually two things to show here, but focus on the right now. Um, it's not only in Parkinson's disease, so we've seen similar patterns in healthy people uh, given different kinds of dopamine medications. And most recently, uh, in collaboration with Roshan Kuhl's lab and uh, postdoc Andrew Westbrook, he showed that if you give people uh, methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, a stimulant that's used to treat ADHD, it affects, uh, rather than affecting sort of cognitive performance, it affects cognitive motivation in a way that is very reminiscent of this sort of uh, benefits versus costs manipulation. That is, if you ask people to make a choice between doing a task that is really hard cognitively versus a task that's easier to do, uh, people generally prefer to do the easier tasks. That's sort of a cost benefit analysis, but you could pay them more money to do the harder task. And the question is how much more money do you have to pay them to do the harder task? Uh, and what this is showing here is simulations from the model that were borne out in the data showing that as you go to sort of the right of your indifference curve, meaning you're more likely to choose the harder task because the benefit of it is worthwhile. If you have high dopamine levels, that preference should be steep. So you're really weighting the benefits more than the costs. And so you, you choose the harder task more and more. Uh, and as you decrease dopamine levels, because you're not weighting the benefit as much, that slope is just more shallow. But what was really diagnostic of this sort of opponency model D1, D2 function is that as you go to the left of the indifference curve, when the costs kind of outweigh the benefits, now that same, fun that same curve of high dopamine levels is actually shallower. So you're essentially discounting the costs more and uh, boosting the benefits. And what Andrew saw in this experiment is that when you give people a dose of Ritalin, which increases striatal dopamine and uh, other cortical uh, neurotransmitters, it has an effect that looks exactly like this. Uh, but moreover, if you used PET imaging in Roshan Kuhl's lab, he found that also you see the same pattern in people who naturally have higher levels of dopamine. They look more like this model with higher levels of dopamine. And the impact of the drug was preference, uh, preferentially applied to those people who had low dopamine levels to begin with. So that is essentially a revision in some ways of the way in which we think about how smart drugs work, where people generally think that they help them to focus or improves their, their cognitive performance. And what this is showing is that it might do so by actually changing your cognitive motivation of how costly it feels to engage in cognitive effort. So uh, all of this stuff that I just mentioned about representations of cost and benefits in the striatal cortical circuitry, I showed you a cartoon before. This is also a cartoon, but it's more detailed in that it's a, a neural dynamical system model of the basal ganglia and its impact of dopamine in these different populations uh, that predicts these kinds of patterns of results, but I'm not gonna go into any more details on that today. Okay. Now, everything I just said is, you know, it's consistent with very successful account of how dopamine ref reflects reward prediction errors and then modifies you know learning and, and choice in striatal circuits uh, but there's a problem so the general idea with that uh, model is that dopamine signals are relatively global that is they sort of go up or down when good things happen or bad things happen but a lot of times you need to figure out not just did something good happen but where in my brain caused something good to happen so just to give you a, a quick motivation here, is you can see these two kids that are sort of having fun sledding going down the hill and they may be experiencing lots of reward prediction errors, but you wouldn't want them to transfer that and to think that they actually you know, really were responsible for those reward prediction errors in a way that involves anything to do with skill to some degree. Whereas uh, this mogul skier here has to very uh, quickly adjust their motor behaviors at each moment in time 
in order to receive reward prediction errors in order to have fun. And if you sort of incorrectly, uh, sorry, I'm <laughs> going in the wrong order here, but if you, if you made an inference here that as you got reward prediction errors from uh, going in, in a sledding example where you're not really responsible for the fun other than gravity, if you generalize that to other tasks, you might you know, try to ski the moguls and, and crash. And to sort of illustrate that in a, in a circuit level model, like why, why is there really a problem here? Um, let's say we have uh, a decision at the lower level of what motor actions to make. These are like pre-motor cortical representations that interact with a basal ganglia circuit involved in motor action selection. Um, that's not the only corticostriatal circuit there is. There are many of these corticostriatal circuits. For example, there's one related to a high level decision of um, you know, what task, what goal am I going to select or what should I put into my working memory or a lot of other high level cognitive decisions. And those circuits look uh, very similar. And the problem is that when you're making any given decision, like should I go skiing, should I grab a coffee or should I move this muscle? You have, you're making all of those decisions at many levels of abstraction at the same time. And if you just have this sort of global dopamine signal, dopamine innervates all levels of these sort of corticostriatal hierarchy at the same time. And it would be very difficult to know essentially which of these circuits to credit. So just to give you one brief example, if you reach for a coffee and you take a sip and it tastes delicious, should you credit that reward prediction error about the delicious coffee to the coffee place or your decision to go get coffee in this particular spot? Or should you credit it to the somewhat awkward reaching movement that you needed to, to make to pick up the coffee because somebody was in your way? If you credit it to the reaching movement, then that wouldn't be uh, very efficient. So you need to have some kind of way of figuring out which circuit was actually most responsible for the prediction error. And it turns out that, that that's borne out computationally that if you don't have a mechanism for credit assignment, the circuits, the learning in these kinds of circuits is, is very inefficient. So one uh, solution to this in work that Randy O'Reilly and I did in a working memory context a long time ago is that you would have some way of, det of detecting that if a given region of the basal ganglia affected the cortex, essentially if it changes the cortical state before you get a reward, then that's a, a, a signal that it actually was likely to have caused something related to the reward. And so there are mechanisms in the output of the basal ganglia that can detect that the, it essentially cause the cortical, to change, cortical state to change. And if you just have that same mechanism also disinhibit dopamine release, then you can have an asymmetry such that the given, the, a given striatal region that was responsible for the outcome gets a boost in credit. And that was one of the mechanisms that we put in neural network models that you just essentially increase the dopamine levels to the circuit that seem to have changed the cortical state and that improved learning. And we had some reason to suspect that maybe that's what was happening in the biology, but it was also somewhat speculative. So we want to now ask, is that the way it works? Uh, and so the overview here is what the idea is that it would be nice to have uh, dopamine signals that are weighted by the actor. By actor, I mean you have different you know, systems in your brain that are trying to control different kinds of actions. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you about is new work in collaboration with Arif Hamid and Chris Moore in a rodent model that actually can record the dynamics of dopamine signals across different parts of the striatum and see if they're uh, behaving in ways that are consistent with actor weighted dopamine signals. Um, and I'm focusing particularly about agency. So in the motive, the reason I gave you the motivation about the sledding versus the skiing, in one case, the skier is actually causally responsible with their actions for the reward prediction errors. Uh, and so what I'm going to tell you about is that we see regionally specific dopamine transients that look like something like reward prediction errors, but we think of them actually as essentially agency prediction errors, ways of detecting whether that part of the striatum is responsible for the outcome. Uh, and moreover, a completely novel uh, finding that Arif made was that you see rather than just a global increase in dopamine, when rewards happen, that there are actually waves of dopamine that, that propagate across the medial lateral axis of the dorsal striatum. Uh, and we think that those reinforce different subregions in order to adapt to behavior. 
And I'll briefly go over a high level computational model that tries to tie those findings together. Okay, see, so this is Arif and he did all the work here. He was a postdoc at the time. He's now just about to begin an assistant professorship in Minnesota. And this is just showing uh, the anatomy of uh, how the midbrain projects its dopamine neurons, its axons, sorry, to the dorsal striatum. Uh, and what Arif did is he placed a window, a, a cannula, an imaging cannula over the dorsal striatum so that he's gonna be able to image uh, roughly 80% of the surface of the dorsal striatum at the same time but not the striatal neuron activities, but rather the axons of the dopamine signals. And he's going to do that in two different ways, looking at the, the activity of the terminals using calcium imaging, but also directly measuring dopamine using something called T-Light. Uh, and so you'll be seeing these sort of top-down fields of view where, uh, you know, to the left is the medial side of the striatum and the right is the lateral side of the striatum. And this is anterior up and posterior down. And anytime you see activity, it's gonna reflect activity of the dopamine projections to that area. And he's doing that while the animals are on a, on a wheel uh, and he can zoom in with a one or two photon microscope, which is essentially just allowing you to look in high or low resolution in, uh, at the dopamine axons. Okay, so of course we didn't put a mouse on a ski hill, but instead, we put the mouse uh, in a box where, or, or on a wheel where they're running. Um, but the task is such that as the animal is running, there are these auditory tones that escalate in frequency until the animal finally at the end gets a water reward and they're thirsty for water. So they're happy about that. Um, and some variants of the task, we also provide these visual cues that provide the same uh, sort of progressive information that they're making progress towards the reward. Uh, but the trick is that there are different structures of the tasks. So one of them, the instrumental task, which is more like the skier, the animal has to run and they have to run a certain distance in order for the tone to go up from one frequency to the next and finally to get the reward. The trick though, is that the amount that the animal has to run before it gets the reward or equivalently the, the amount it has to run for each tone to change is sampled from a uniform distribution across trials. So the animal doesn't really know in advance uh, whether it has to, when it has to run, whether it has to run five centimeters to move the tone or eight centimeters or so far. So it has to sort of listen to the tones to figure out how far it is to, uh, to the reward. But in the sort of more sledding task, which is more Pavlovian, everything is exactly the same and the animal can run if he wants to, but uh, it doesn't, the animal doesn't need to run. So the, rather the, um, the time to reward is just sampled from a, a distribution and the tones happen regardless of whether the animal is running or not. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to go, go over this, but I'll, you just have to trust me that the mice, we have behavioral evidence through the animals licking that the mice are paying attention to these tones as they're advancing in the trial to get a sense of how far they are towards the, the end of the trial. And so the main reason we do this is we want to ask questions of, are there specific striatal regions that seem to get more credit when the animal is in control of the outcomes, when it has agency? And we're focusing on the dorsomedial striatum uh, because that's a region of the striatum that people have identified in rodents as being responsible for uh, goal-directed behavior. So representing action outcome contingencies or uh, which are, are necessary for agency. So we want to know, you know, is the dorsal medial striatum preferentially engaged and reinforced when the actions are responsible uh, for attaining rewards? So um, as the animal progresses in the task, if we get evidence that the animal is in the instrumental condition, uh, we predicted the dor dorsal medial striatum would get more reinforcement. But if the animal is not in control of the outcomes, then it would actually get less reinforcement, even though the animal is still getting reward. Okay, so. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is just the dopamine signals when the animal is getting the reward in the instrumental task. And here I'm going to show you a video of the activity, the terminal activity of the dopamine axons, which will be aligned at zero seconds to when the animal gets the reward, and it'll be played twice. So the first thing you see is that the big surge of white activity suggests that there was a big burst of dopamine. But that burst of dopamine didn't happen in all regions of the striatum at the same time. It seemed to initiate on the more medial side of the striatum and then propagate it away towards the lateral striatum. Uh, 
Interestingly, if you look at what happens in the Pavlovian task, you know, the animal is still getting the tones and then they get reward. They just didn't need to run, even though they sometimes do run. In that case, you also see a burst of dopamine and it's also a wave, but it seems to propagate in the opposite direction. So it does not start in the medial striatum, it starts in the lateral striatum. And you can quantify that across animals and sessions. And uh, these are sort of vector fields where Arif used uh, optical uh, flow methods to quantify the flow of these waves. And this is just showing that the average vectors are projecting from medial towards lateral when the animal gets reward in the instrumental session but it's projecting in the other direction when the animal gets reward in the uh, Pavlovian session. Uh, and finally, if you look at what happens to the waves when the animal gets reward initially before they've learned that they're in either task, uh, you can see that there's some interesting spatial temporal dynamics, but the waves are not really going in one direction or the other, they're sort of irregular. So the summary of all of this is that this spatial temporal trajectory of when the dopamine axons get activated seems to be learnt because it's not there in naive animals, but it's also sensitive to task structure in the sense that if the animal was in control of the actions, you get this wave that starts in the medial striatum and, project, and projects laterally, uh, whereas if it's in the other task, it goes the other way. Uh, and we think of that as sort of like a potentially related to an actor weighted or vector reward prediction error that rather instead of it being scalar, you have actually information about which region of the striatum was related to the uh, reward. And we think that could be used for credit assignment in the following way, so I'll show you. Uh, and if you're interested in the details, the, the paper was published a few months ago in Cell. Okay, so what I told you so far was just, you know, one session, the animal's doing Pavlovian, another one, it's instrumental. So we wanted to, to check a little bit more carefully whether the animal can sort of in an online way, figure out whether they are in control of the rewards. And this is just showing that in a task where we reverse between Pavlovian to instrumental, behaviorally, they seem to realize that they don't need to run when they're in the Pavlovian condition. They, they still sometimes run, but then as soon as it switches to instrumental, they start running and, and vice versa. If it was in instrumental and then it comes to Pavlovian, they sort of slowly stop running. So they are detecting that the need for running in order to get rewards. Uh, and uh, you can now look at um, both the activity of the dopamine uh, axons using GCAMP, which is a way of measuring calcium, or just directly measuring dopamine using D-Light. And I'll just show you what that looks like in the two different sessions. Again, you can see waves that go in opposite directions, depending on whether the animal is in the Pavlovian block or the instrumental block before, the before or after the reversal. And the same thing is true at the terminals. Um, and that is significant. Um, but moreover, if you look at the trial by trial dynamics, so this is now an individual animal and we're quantifying the wave direction when it's in the Pavlovian block in pink. And this sort of arrow to the left means it's, it's starting in the lateral striatum and, and projecting medially. And, you know, sometimes it's not exactly in the same direction, but on average, it's going um, from lateral to medial. And then here is suddenly a block change that the animal couldn't predict. And you can see for the first couple of trials that the wave is still going in that direction even though the animal had to be running in order to make the reward happen. And then they sort of realize they're in control of the outcomes and the wave starts going the other way around. And so summarizing that across animals, you can see that the, there's a reversal in the direction of the wave as the animal goes from instrumental to Pavlovian and Pavlovian to instrumental, much like uh, the reversal of their velocities that detect that they're in those different sessions. Um, so that raises the question of how can these waves be used for credit assignment? Uh, and I'll just give you a, a quick sketch of this because I don't really have time to go into it in detail. But if you, if you plot what the impact of this wave is across the striatum and you just plot the sort of the trajectory in any one region of interest as you go from, in this case, uh, lateral to medial, what that induces is an offset in the peak of the dopamine signal sort of just in some ways, it's just another way of plotting the wave because if there's a wave, that means that some regions that are on one side of the striatum get the peak earlier than others. Um, and we know from uh, synaptic plasticity studies 
that the timing of dopamine signals matters a lot for how much reinforcement you get relative to the timing of glutamate or of the neurons underneath that are going on in the spiny cells. So this is an example of one study uh, from Yagashita et al. that showed that if you have glutamate in a given spine in a medium striatum neuron, then in order to get synaptic plasticity, in order for that spine to grow and for the animal to learn, dopamine has to arrive soon afterwards within a time region of, of you know, about one, one second, and then it sort of falls off. And uh, there are various models of that in reinforcement learning as well that involve something like eligibility traces, which essentially means that um, if you have no delay, you're gonna get a lot of reinforcement for the action that predict or, or the stimulus that predicted that reward. But as you increase the delay, you can still learn through something called eligibility traces, even if the neuron isn't active, but it sort of progressively declines across time. And so you can simulate that and show that if you just induce a wave in a bank of reinforcement learning agents with different, um, uh, different delays, that the credit preferentially goes to the agent that had the smallest delay. Um, and that gets mediated by changes in the value function in ways that I don't have to go into. My high level uh, summary here is that the, we think computationally the wave can induce credit assignment by saying that the regions that get the soonest dopamine waves, those dopamine uh, signals are the ones that get the most credit essentially. Okay, so um, we can then put this together into a computational model that tries to predict how, how can we decide which direction the wave should go to in the first place, right? So there's two different tasks, Pavlovian instrumental. How could the animal actually, I, I told you the wave goes in opposite directions, but computationally, how could that occur? And so we modeled this in a high level with something called a mixture of experts model, where we assume that what the animal is doing is trying to figure out, am I, am I in this sort of distance task where I have to run to get rewards, or am I in a time task where I just have to wait? And for each one of those experts, it has to take into account the uncertainty that there are many different contingencies, right? So sometimes the animal needs to run five centimeters to move the tone, sometimes it's eight centimeters, sometimes it's three centimeters, and so forth. Uh, and at the end of the day, it has to decide, okay, which one of these subtasks am I in? What, which task am I in? And then should I run and how fast should I run? And so the idea is that the animal has to assign credit by first accumulating evidence over the course of the trial based on the tones that are uh, happening and how congruent they are with the animal's actions. Uh, and it has to accum accumulate evidence for those sub-experts that best predict the tone transitions. An agency, a measure of agency here is just simply whether the action is congruent with uh, the outcome, in this case, the, the tone. So if you have these two different trials that are sort of like a short trial and a long trial, uh, at the lowest level of this model, there are reward prediction errors. Each one of these sub-experts is making a prediction using standard reinforcement learning about when it expects uh, tones to occur or when it expects the value function to change. And uh, in a short trial, that would lead to reward prediction errors because for a given sub-expert, it may not expect those uh, tones to occur as fast as they are occurring. Whereas for a longer trial, those, you know, the tones are happening at different periods of time and, um, and the prediction errors are not as large um, because of the way that reinforcement learning models work that when, when things are shorter, uh, the discounted future reward is, uh, is larger. That's uh, kind of a detail. Uh, but the, the main point here is that the lowest level of the model should expect that should have some reward prediction errors every time tones arrive because it can't, it doesn't know exactly when the tones are going to arrive because of the uniform distribution. But it can use those reward prediction errors to make inferences about which of its sort of experts is most likely predictive of the task. So um, you can plot the sort of responsibility given the, the amount of prediction errors that have been occurred across the different sub-experts. And in a given trial, it may be that the responsibility of like the eight centimeter sub-expert will be higher than those for the other ones. And, uh, at the, and that would predict that you sort of get these ramping uh, dynamics in the sub-experts, which I, I, I'm not gonna have time to, to go into and how that maps to the dopamine signals, but I'm happy to talk about it later. Um, but 
And then at the highest level, we would predict that as you accumulate these prediction errors across all the sub experts for both the distance expert and the time expert, you can decide, okay, well, it seems like if I'm in the distance task, I'm better able to predict the tones across all of my sub experts and therefore the responsibility of that expert is high. Whereas in the Pavlovian task, the responsibility should actually be low. Um, so we basically, we think of this distance expert as a dorsal medial striatum. That's the one that's responsible for action outcome contingencies. And so there are regions of the dorsal striatum that should be getting these prediction errors and then ramping up to decide whether they're responsible for reward. And then we think that that can then condition the dopamine waves to go in the, the correct direction. Okay, so that was kind of a lot, but the, the idea is that you, the animal can use that ramping signal or use that inference about agency to then uh, direct the wave in one direction or another. And then that wave through this mechanism of credit assignment will cause the model to run. Uh, so we have like a speed output of the model and it will start running more in instrumental condition and less in the Pavlovian condition. Okay, so the predictions uh, are, there's sort of three different levels of predictions that we, I just illustrated that you see these sort of sub-expert like reward prediction errors where here I've aligned it not by time by, but by percent complete so that the, the prediction errors should all happen at the same time on the x-axis. Um, and uh, that that should be translate into the ability to accumulate those prediction errors in order to determine responsibility, which should then direct the wave. And that, that affects running. So Arif looked into the brain using uh, the calcium imaging here and D-Light to look for evidence for this sort of mixture of experts-like uh, arrangement. And at the lowest level, he used two photon imaging to look at individual axon segments. And he found what I think were really interesting, which is that individual axon segments seem to show these reward prediction error like responses that are specific to individual tones. So there were some axon segments that seem to mostly respond only to the tone transition from one to two. There are other axon segments that respond from the, to represent the second tone transition, the third transition and so forth. And it's tiled the whole space. Moreover, for each one of those cases, it was always larger in the shorter trials compared to the larger trials, which is what is expected from a reward prediction error uh, response. So these are reward prediction errors, but we think that they're actually used in, in, in essence, more like a predictive coding mechanism, kind of like what uh, Yuki was talking about, because we think that they're used for inference about agency. So when the animal is getting a lot of reward prediction errors, that means that uh, that particular region of the striatum is actually not predicting the data the best and it should not get the most credit. Uh, and so I uh, don't have time again to go into this in detail, but we do see at the, at the larger picture level that the dorsal medial striatum as the animal is progressing towards the reward, it shows these ramping in the dopamine signals in the instrumental task. And it shows ramping down in the Pavlovian task, much like uh, the, the mixture of extras model predicted. Uh, and then finally, just we can test whether there's actually an effect of uh, credit assignment here. Uh, so remember I showed you that the, the animal runs more in the instrumental task after the reward, after the block reversal and it runs less than the Pavlovian task. So we can ask whether the wave direction on previous trials actually influences the animals running on subsequent trials in ways that accord with reinforcement learning. And that's what this analysis that Arif did shows is that, that you can estimate the impact of the wave direction from the last reward, the reward before that, and the reward before that. And he shows this sort of exponentially declining function which is consistent with uh, what you expect from reinforcement learning that essentially, it's not just whether dopamine went up on the last trial here, it's whether the, the wave direction went from medial to lateral instead of the other way around. And as the more it went from medial to lateral on the last trial, the more the animal runs on the next trial. Okay, so the summary of all this is that we see really much more uh, refined and uh, I guess complex, but interesting dynamics in the dopamine signal that is not just goes going up and down for reward prediction errors, but rather we see waves, we see ramps, and we see transients across the dorsal striatum. The transients are these sort of reward prediction error signals that we think occur about the task structure when the animal can't predict exactly when tones are going to change, but it gives it evidence that it's in control, it's agentic or not. Uh, and we think the ramps reflect the, essentially the cumulative evidence for agency, which then drives the motivation for the animal to work, to, to run or to not. And then the waves uh, 
are sensitive to this trash structure that can use uh, that can be used to guide credit and to for the animal to learn whether they're in control or not. Of course, there are many open questions about whether these, this is the right computational account that links these findings and what are the underlying mechanisms of this. Um, but I also think it's interesting to think about in terms of basic systems neuroscience and computation, which would then allow us to go back to understanding how pathologies in this system can be related to disorders, because there are a lot of disorders that certainly related to um, action selection and agency. Okay, so that with that, I want to thank everyone, especially Arif, who did pretty much all that work, and my collaborator, Chris Moore, on the systems neuroscience, uh, Andrew Westbrook and Rashan Cools, my lab funders, and you for listening. Thank you. <laughs>